What's going on everybody? It's Chip Walton. Welcome to Chop and Brew Mead Master Steve Fletty Part 2. This is a continuation of our conversation from the last episode with Master Mead Maker Steve Fletty. We were in his basement. We did a flight of three very different meads. Uh, that was in the last episode and then that led to a fourth mead because why not? And then that kind of we had a little buzz on, we were getting some good conversation going, uh, so that's what's about to unfold here. And it's a little more loosey-goosey, as you'll see, but it's full of great information. Yeast health, fermentation, uh, a lot about fruit meats specifically, but then he goes into aging, uh, into blending, and he kind of does a little prescriptive um, how to make bad mead, how to make good mead. Uh, what could have been done to those bad meads to have made them good meads. So it, it's really cool. Towards the end, it just kind of trails off. Uh, literally, we start talking about a smoked mead project and we just kind of tangentialize all over the place. So it does end kind of, <laughs> just kind of fades out. But the first 20, 25 minutes are some good stuff. So happy National Mead Day uh, for Saturday in August. Please check out Fletty's recipes that he's nice enough to share underneath the episode. Also support Chop and Brew, chopandbrew.com. Donate, buy some merch. Uh, let's get the show on the road with part two with master mead maker Steve Fletty. Cheers. What do we got here? We have a tart cherry mead. Can I get the water? Oh, you need a rinse? Yes, Go. sir. What makes this one special? Well, apparently it's not special because it never wins. Oh. I keep entering it. And I, I love this mead. I love like these. So a bunch of us make these big fruity meads. Uh, 12 to 16 percent ABV. When you like, say we, I think Kurt, Kurt Stock, Stock's in that list, right? Okay. Me, Kurt, Thomas. Uh, and we got the idea of probably from uh, Ken Schramm, Heart of Darkness. And when you say um, big fruit, what are we talking poundage of fruit? We're talking to ratio 20 of... pounds of fruit in a five gallon batch, at least. Right. At least. Oh, you're dealing with yeah, You need some more of that. So Thomas is the expert at this, I think. He he won Mead Maker of the Year with something like this. Well, his is, mine is nowhere near as good as Thomas's, but I, I think it's good, but it's like, he's the expert at making meads like in this category. So, really? Like huge, intense fruit, um, not a lot. There's sweetness there, but it, it's it's gonna be balanced by the, the acidity, the tannin, and uh, it's gonna clean up on the end. There's gonna be some alcohol, but it, it I don't know, I think it's just, uh, it's on the end of the big end of a mead. And this, um, and I've thought this with some of Kurt's black currant or black currant blend, starts to get us, at least in aroma, I haven't tasted it yet, it starts to get us into red wine territory. Sorta? Yeah. But red wines generally aren't sweet. So that's the difference. But that smell, that smells like a skin a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what, um, what kind of honey is this? Wildflower. So this is kind of one of those situations where you can go with that yeah, a good base honey flower. because yeah. you almost don't want to overshadow how many pounds of fruit? Uh, there's, there's 20 pounds of tart cherries in the five gallon batch. I wanted to ask, uh, so fruit, I uh, recently got into a slap fight online as is want to happen about because I was telling someone they just need to freeze a fruit to sterilize it, let it thaw, put it in, and they were making the point that they had read a lot of stuff that said no, to truly sterilize you need to bring it to at least kind of like 120, 130 uh -huh. simmer. Do you have, I guess A, I'm asking you your process there, is it fresh, frozen, warmed slightly, and then do you have an opinion on the sterilization <sighs> slap fight? I, I don't think you want to heat your fruit because you're going to cook it. You're going to change the flavor, even at a low temp. Even at a low temp, you're going hmm. to alter the flavor. Uh, if you want to, if you want, if you're worried about wild yeast, then you should use some sulfite. So, I actually early on in mead making, I had some a mead go bad that I didn't sulfite. You know, so I was out there pressing apples all day. You know, just windfalls, and uh, initially this mead was fantastic. Then it went just went south. 
it developed some just nastiness. There was a white ring in the bottle, and since then I always saw flavor. Really? Yes. Did you just say apples? Apples. Yeah. What's the connection? Did you make a mead with apples? A was cider. Like a cider? Yeah. Oh. So pressed apples. Gotcha. We use the, the 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 cider as as the or you know the water. To and in this case, the apple is what brought in. Right. We're just picking apples up off the ground. So you know what you know what's on the ground. Lots of nasty things. Oh, I've never heard that phrase. Is that what a windfall is? Yeah, windfall. It's yeah. Ground apples. Yep. Ground apples. So now I will always uh, sulfite fruit must. Okay. So, and that, in that way, you can skip the heating, the freezing, right. this and that. It's yep. just fresh. It's gonna you just kill any wild yeast, um, and then you know wait a day and pitch your yeast the next day. Okay, so if you had been making a fruit mead tonight, we would have done all of those steps, but you would just cover it and leave it. Yeah, with the sulfite pitch tomorrow. And generally, I like to freeze the any fruit so it breaks it down. So you'd freeze it not because of sterilization, but no. because it the just to as break it, thaws, it down. It's yeah. ready to just right. leach in there. Yep. Yeah, the first meat I ever made, um, and I haven't made many. So when I say the first, I mean like the first of two or three. It was uh, Elsa and I's first anniversary, and I was like, well, let's make an anniversary mead, and we'll drink some of it every year on the anniversary, and we went. Over the top. We did Kurt's triple berry mead, but I can't remember. I think it was like 18 pounds of honey and like the 15 or 16 pounds of the fruit and ended up being like 18% alcohol. <laughs> but because of the staggered nutrient addition, it wasn't hot. It was ready to go. Oh, yeah. Other than the fact that through it, we realized that Elsa has a honey allergy in Minnesota where she did not in Texas. So I don't know. We need to one day... Just dedicate a day, set her up with like 20 varieties, and do little samples. Because the problem is she tries decent amounts of different ones, and if it's a bad one, it shuts her down. It's really? A, it's a throat closer kind huh. of thing. Um, but the point being, so we made that mead, and it was beautiful, and this lovely like dark pink, and f super fruity, and... But then she couldn't drink any of it. It was like wow. this 18% mead that I had to like suffer through myself. And it took about five years of sharing it. And yeah. I call it my laundry pour when you're going down to get do some laundry <laughs> to get a little. She's like, that. how is that disappearing? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Evaporating. Yeah. Um, and then the only other one I made was this these two that I brought you. And they're just one gallon batches based on Mino Choi's kind of process for making like a seven or eight percent one. So I really want to get back into it, but honestly her allergy is what huh. kind of sets back the effort because I, you know, I want to be able to enjoy it with her. Um, so we need to just get on a hunt. She seems to think that Orange Blossom is one that she can handle from having been to Kurt's house and having a couple that were like, no, this one, I can do this one. So, well, it must be a pollen thing. Not sure. How far out of your way have you gone for raw materials? Whether it's honey, whether it's fruit. Oh. Well, tomorrow morning I'm driving to Delano to pick up tart cherries. <laughs> yeah, it's the same ones that kind of went into this. Yeah. So, you know, that'll take me a good two, three hours of my day to, to do that. Um... Let's see, and you know, a bunch. We used to, a bunch of us used to go black currant picking. Now is the season for that, right? I feel like I've seen a lot of I think pictures we're a of little, people. Yeah, like the last, um, like a week or two ago, was probably the peak. Here. Oh, okay. But black currants are a pain in the ass to pick because they're just. <sighs> they look small to begin with. The There's, ones I've yeah, seen, you need, yeah, are smaller than blueberries, and they're about the same size. I'd rather pick raspberries and get all scratched up. I, I, I hate picking blueberries. Blueberries are, so, are there. Have you ever picked blueberries? They're as bad as picking, almost as bad as picking blueberries. As far as just how hidden they are and how much you have to get in the weeds to the get them. The time it takes. Okay. Just to like, because they're little. You know, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. You need a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The crawfish, <laughs> the the crawfish effect. It's a lot of work for a little payoff. But the meat tastes so good. It does. So with black currant, you do the same thing, just freeze them 
let them crack open and then mm -hmm. do you put them in a bag do you put your fruits in a bag and you just totally let them i just throw it all in there really? I, mean, I i've never tried the bag thing it looks uh easier perhaps i i, I don't know I, i'm kind of uh and it's probably just ignorance on my part but i i, I want the flute i want the fruit to like be Totally there, like unin uninhibited, you know. <laughs> so how do you separate? It? Just racking, from racking under it. You yeah, don't do any from other kind it. of uh, filter or strainer. No. Or... no. You don't even shove like a, a muslin bag on the end of the siphon. No. Just let it go, huh? Just let it go. Yeah, the um, the method I'd seen was, I mean, I just kind of took Kurt's video and was like, I'm gonna do this in my house. So yeah, we got the bag and. But you're saying you can just throw it in willy nilly, and you, you would can. still throw, or you would still do your uh, your wine whip with the fruit in there. Just be a little more careful so things don't start right. shooting out. Yeah, if you're ever yeah if you're ever degassing, be very careful, and you can create the uh, the mead the, the mead volcano. I yeah, and it happened to me the first time. Oh my god! How do you avoid it? By you put the wine whip in all the way down, and then start it. Start slow. Just start slow. Just start slow. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, see, and this will be perfect. This will give us a reason to tease this video from the real episode, because surely this ain't all going in that now. <laughs> Staggered Nutrient Edition. It's kind of like that aha miracle moment for a lot of people um, to get over that hump of how long it takes to age a mead. But you've kind of gone over that hump and then over that hump and come back to just doing it kind of all at once, right? <sighs> Or does it change based on what's in there? Well, you know, I've done the staggered nutrient edition, and yeah, that was a big aha at, at a certain point in time. Right. And then I got lazy, and I just started throwing everything in at the beginning, and I didn't notice any difference. So the amount itself same uh, amount seemed but, important. Yeah, same amount, but I just you know, throw it all in at the beginning, and you know, I'm not uh, having any bad results. I don't think so. <laughs> so <laughs> Insert clip of Mead Maker of the Year award, which we should actually get a shot of. Where but is that? It's around here somewhere. You don't even know. You're like, eh, it's, it's in a box. I think it's, it's in very a box. close to the Goodwill pile. <laughs> we got rid of that. So, what are people doing wrong? It's the amount of fuel to help the yeast at first. It seems kind of like the frequency, but what it really is is just a shortage in that old way of thinking about it. What are people doing wrong? Um, what were people doing wrong? Because now what? people don't seem to be doing... No, there's still people making shitty meat out there. And yeah. it's like, how, well, come on, this is, <laughs> this is not hard, people. I'm, if I can do it, you can do it. Seriously, the come on. The internet is no. trying its hardest oh my to God. <laughs> Seriously, judging mead, uh, uh, oh my God, uh, in, in second round at uh, Homebrew Con, I've had so much shitty mead. It's like, what? How did this even make it here? It's like, you don't know what on earth you're doing. Oh my God. Stop wasting Tupelo honey. Send me your Tupelo honey. I will ferment it for you and send it back to you, and it won't have fusels in it. Oh my! No. Seriously, I'll, there'll be a small bottle fee, however. But at least you'll get some good meat out of it. <laughs> <sighs> so people are still making bad meat. No, seriously, they are making terrible meat. And what when you taste these off meads prescriptively, what is wrong still? process-wise too dry I mean okay you can make a good dry mead but it's difficult not enough fruit too alcoholic over acidification I don't acidify my meats it, it very rarely if you're doing everything correctly will you need any acid I mean maybe a touch but you know just it, people are adding way too much acid to try to balance sweetness really yes and they're adding the wrong acid. Um, they should be using tartaric and not malic and not the acid blend. Well, so what naturally does that acid for you if you're doing it? Well, if you're doing fruit meads, I mean, you know, uh, 
blackberry. I mean, a lot of those fruits have, you know, blackberries, uh, raspberries, black currants will have acidity in there. So you know, get your sweetness right and a fruit in there is like, eh, you don't have to worry about it. Would these dry meads benefit from someone knowing how to back sweeten? Yes. Uh, that, oh, there's another flaw for you. Like, uh, cloying, fat is another word for cloying. Um, just like, uh, it lies there. It's like, it, it's sweet. There's nothing else going on. Like, I don't want any more of that. <laughs> um, you, it, if it's too sweet, some acid is probably not going to rescue that. It might help, but you know, it's acidity, acidifying a mead is for fine tuning, not not trying to clean up a mess you've made. They're like putting it in a sour barrel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Got me. <laughs> well, you didn't make that mess. Chris England made that mess. Chris England made that mess. Oh, really clean up Chris? <laughs> No, but I, I am totally appreciating um, this conversation because that is, it comes back to beer. People start doing this thing. They think it's going to be easy. Uh, it can be easy, but they don't realize that in the end, there's just, there's a lot of balance and equilibrium. And you can't just say because this happened in what I chose as a process, this is how I'm going to fix it. You need to just take what you got, run with it. And then next time, no to balance stuff. Right. You can't throw chemicals to do what maybe a little better thought on the front end would have done, whether it's the honey, whether it's a fruit, whether it's intentionally stall fermentation if you really want it to be at this number, stop it. I mean, don't let it keep going. Good honey, good process, you know, fresh fruit, good fruit or ingredients, spices, whatever. The worst thing that can happen to you is, is your meat is going to ferment dry, but you can back sweeten. Some people think you can't do it, but you can. It, it, you don't go overboard, and you're going to be fine. You know, you, you want uh, around 1024 to my palate is semi sweet. So, I, oh, I don't have my phone. Um, there's an app. There's an app called BrewBot, which lets you uh, calculate uh, back sweetening. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. yeah. I wrote the app. Okay, so I'm, this is a shameless plug for my. Did app. you write Brewbot? Yes, I did. So it's it's two dollars. Come on, do yourself a favor. <laughs> Brewbot, calculate your back sweetening. Do you blend much, or do your batches oh. pretty much come as is? Blending, yes. Seriously, that's a tool that um, maybe uh, not a lot of mead makers use that you can totally use. If you have a batch that's from that's too dry. You know, or make a super sweet batch and blend them together to get the balance correct. Or, you know, you might have a batch that's too sweet, you know, make, make something dry and then blend together. I do that all the time. Or not all the oh, time, really? but quite often, yeah. Meaning you don't have to have an arsenal of carboys lined up with two no, gallons in them. No, the no, key no. is just knowing how to kind of quickly right. make up the balance. Right. Sometimes, uh, you know, something goes dry or, you know, gets stuck and, you know, you have to, you know, if you... A good way to, to save that batch is to, you know, make something dry or sweet and blend it. Or you think you have flavors that might go together, you can experiment by, it, it, you know, maybe you don't want to, like, you know, throw all the ingredients into one. You make, like, two separate batches and you blend them together to get those flavors. For example, I blended my uh, cherry mead with my orange blossom Riesling mead to make a cherry Riesling mead, which... A lot of people really like. Have you ever entered some of those? Just like, <laughs> literally did like three bottles just to like have a different well, one. I, I actually a few years ago I I made two bottles of a cherry riesling. <laughs> two bottles. That's it. Two twelve ounce bottles. Two twelve ounce bottles. I had a this cherry mead. This a version of this cherry mead, and my orange blossom riesling mead. So I, and I made two bottles like. Two thirds of that, one third of that. Entered them in the state fair. Uh, best of show runner up. <laughs> and I won best of show for a beer. So. <laughs> and someone asked me, hey, how'd you make that cherry Riesling meat? It was like, uh, blended up two bottles. <laughs> they were so angry. But they were good, right? I mean, <laughs> were they, they were good. They were probably both good separately, so why wouldn't they be good together? <laughs> it's like chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> Who put this chocolate in my peanut butter? I know. <laughs> Oh. Have you ever had a peanut butter mead? Interesting. No. I could see the cacao influence wow. in the pea. What's it called? PB2? 
the I have to say, I hate peanut butter beers. I do too, so. I've had only one good peanut butter beer in my life. Ugh. So back in the day, we're talking way back in the day, you know, there was the myth that a good mead was gonna take two or three years to become drinkable and then to staggered. Uh, Nutrient addition or whatever it is that people learned, we figured out that we could do these very quickly. But what is the benefit of aging, uh, whether it's intentional or as a way to fix something? Flavors just meld better, or uh, all the, a friend of mine likes to call it, all the elbows <laughs> round out. <laughs> yeah. They get, you can make a good mead that's drinkable within, even a big mead, even like a 14 to 60% ABV mead, you can make a good mead that strong in three months. Yeah, you know, with all the you know, if it's a fruit mead, you're gonna it's gonna take two to three weeks. It should take no more than two weeks to ferment. And you, you probably want to you know rack it off and fine it, let it settle or whatever, pro, you know, package it. But that can be you know two two to three months. But that mead is gonna round out. It's gonna taste better at three months. It's gonna taste probably a little even better than that at six months. But it's not gonna take you know years. You know. You can probably keep that mead for years. There's a peak in there somewhere. Who knows where that peak is? But you can drink that mead young. And back in the day, was that myth because it was taking that long to ferment, or were they fermenting in the same amount of time, but they uh, they were just fermenting hot? They so were fermenting. The I think they were, were fermenting, about mellowing alcohol. Th exactly. Yeah, I think they were fermenting hot. I, th I don't think they were giving the yeast any nutrients. I don't think they were using enough yeast, and so you wind up with this nasty, fusily, boozy, you know, kerosene bomb that maybe after five years might be somewhat drinkable. Because mm, that it, it, mead, I, when, when I started homebrewing, it used to be kind of a joke. You'd have like, hey, I had this five-year-old mead. It was, <laughs> it was kind of sort of drinkable. It's like, it's <laughs> because yeah, you were doing it wrong. You know? Now we've learned all these, you know good techniques from winemaking that we can apply right. and there's no reason that you need to take X number of years. It wasn't the honey? You're, you're not no. you're telling me 1970s honey wasn't? It was probably good honey. <laughs> Might have even been better, right? That's 40 years of pollution. Oh, now we're getting political. Oh, God. 40 years of pollution in Monsanto. Uh, Mead Santo. Mead Santo. <laughs> Are there smoked honeys, or if you wanted smoke in a mead, does it come through things like peppers or oh, I've uh, never run even across wood? a smoked honey. That yeah. sounds kind of interesting. I bet you could smoke a honey. Someone should make a smoke boche. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Maybe that's what I should do. <laughs> How would you smoke honey? Could you put it in a big pan I think on you, a smoker yeah. and then just keep stirring it every fifteen yeah. minutes to reintroduce yeah. a fresh new top layer? That's I think this is a new episode. <laughs> well, I jokingly, because, you know, there's a Snoop Dogg song that's like, smoke weed every day, and you hear it, like, you know, quoted. <laughs> Brian Adams and I are always like, Sme smoke mead every day. <laughs> Not that we ever had one. I'm oh, just, my God. And this like, is a new, you, you, Brian, and I need to do this. All right, so there's a Chambru episode called Smoke Mead Every Day. <laughs> do you think that would be the best way to get smoking? I can't think of many other ways other than smoking something that you put into it, whether it be pepper. Fruit. Well, that's the only other way, yeah. But if you wanted a true smoked mead and not a true uh, a mellow mel or a specialty smoked mead, I mean, you really have to figure out a way to get yeah. smoke into the honey or into the water. It could also be in the water, I suppose. Where did I see someone? Was it on, like, food TV? Someone, like, smoking water for, like, I forget what it was. Like... <laughs> Is this all did like? I, did I see that on a food? Someone <laughs> smoking <laughs> water? Dude, that, that was a, well, they like smoke cocktails, right? I mean, they well, do exactly. The, they'll burn some stuff and then cup it. And the idea is, it's, yeah, yeah. Is, we this, should, is this blooper real stuff now? Uh, this, is, this might be the beginning of the smoke mead every day episode when we explain the backstory. I was drinking a bunch of mead one night on Steve Fletty's bar. No, I've always. Uh, God, that would be so funny if I should send this chunk to Brian. And be like, how was your night in Hawaii? This is what happened in St. Paul. We think we figured out how to smoke mead every day. 
<laughs> Seriously. I love. Did I see on a food show smoking water? No, someone's. I, no, I, seriously. No, they do. I've seen it. They they figured out I all kinds of ways to infuse. If you can get smoke in there, right. it's kind of like oxygen. If you can get smoked in an enclosed space with liquid and then shake it, it's gonna take on smoke. Yeah, get a wide, shallow pad. Put your honey in there. Indirect heat. And and some it's gonna smoke. be nice and warm. Do you think you could do it straight out of the smoker, or would it be better to put it into a vessel and let it sit for a couple of days as far as oh. uh, pulling that in? Or could you do it straight off the smoker when it's nice and warm and runny? Probably could. Yeah, we smoked salt a couple of weeks ago just for the hell of it. We had a little bit of fire left in my friend Joe's smoker, and he just took just Morton salt, put it on a, a, f a piece of foil. Uh-huh. And we left it on there with um, mesquite for like an hour. And it's, it soaked it up. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, from here we really just kind of digress into all kinds of tangents. Once you get me and Steve Filetti talking about smoke, meat, mead, uh, the focus kind of went off the rails a little bit. So uh, this is how we're going to end the episode back on my porch. Big shout out to Steve Fletty. Big shout out to all the master mead makers of Minnesota. And there are a lot of them, as you heard the list named out a couple of times in this episode. Uh, it's really overwhelming and a great point of uh, education to be surrounded by these guys. Um, thanks also to the AHA and National Mead Day coming up August. I can't even remember the date. I think it's August 5th this year, but it's always the first Saturday of um, August so check out Steve's recipes and make up a batch of meat it's easy it's simple it's quick and if you do it right the results are very enjoyable so until the next episode go get your meat on go get your meat on too smoke some meat smoke some mead we'll see you back here for the next chop and brew cheers gonna ask this um and i will it's like purred I'm, I'm sorry do you watch parts and rec i haven't no we've been like binge watching it uh and purred happily who is like their version of a local kind of talk commentary talk show moderator he always says like <laughs> like exactly what's happening he's like i have a question and that is what i'm going to ask <laughs> right now so anyway um let me ask you about Boucher. Oh, I'm sorry, I drank most of the rest of that. That's fine. 20. I got more. What else should we... Yeah, it seems like every time we kind of go off tangent, it's another thing. You're like, <laughs> oh, I meant to talk about that. <laughs> what are some other things that we could tactfully bring up that are annoying, but we don't... We sound more helpful than... Douchey. Good question. How do we steer people to the right side?